We need to have a name though. What would we name it? We should just alternate weeks on and off. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we were in the middle of this lecture on second order systems in transient response, right? Um, recall this uh, uh, governing equation here of a second order system in its standard form. This is the form of the forcing function here. And we derived the free response and also the step forced response, right? Well, actually, we didn't really derive them. We kind of stated them and described them and qualitatively tried to understand them. Um, deriving them is not too hard. It's just time, you know? But I do encourage you all to do so. You all could do it um, in theory. So this is... Uh, what we're going to do today is sort of finish up. We had done the step response, and we were uh, right here. We had seen that the step response looks like that. Remember, we have underdamped, critically damped, overdamped situations. And then the other possibilities are that it could be marginally stable and just oscillate, or be unstable. OK. So today, we're just going to slow down, and we're going to do, we're going to talk about First of all, this table um, that's, there's a, a, a pretty large table on the next page, and it looks a little scary. So we're going to talk through that, talk about impulse response and ramp response, too. And then we're going to do an example of how to use superposition and, uh, uh, well, actually, just superposition. We're going to use superposition to construct a solution um, from these tables, OK? so that we don't have to solve the differential equation completely ourselves. If you're thinking, oh, yes, I don't need to actually know my differential equations that well for this class, because I can just use the tables, you're wrong. You're wrong. Um, what is the term? I think it's kick that filthy thought. Something like that. Am I right? Am I right? What was it? It's maybe he's on the radio now, so he's like always on my mind. He's the DJ on the radio. It's weird. Yeah. At first, I was like, like, oh, that's weird that somebody like took his name, and then I was like, oh no, that's definitely him. So, anyways, all right. So mix lots on the radio. Check it out. So uh, impulse and ramp responses. So we talked about impulse functions, right? Uh, actually, distributions, but there are those little spikes, and they model for us a uh, uh, sort of peak, sharp increase in our input, right? Just very uh, momentary, sharp increase. Uh, and then we also had a um, uh, discussion of unit step inputs, which we found the response for in, in the last lecture. And now in this uh, uh, lecture, we're going to also include ramp response as well. So ramp response um, is for a, an input that ramps up steadily. So we're going to look at the table that has all of, of these uh, solutions in it. Let's do it this way. So let's look at that first. So it's table 1.2. And, and let's just like actually like read the caption and just like march through this table and just try to make sure we understand the whole thing. So we're talking about second order systems of this standard form. Uh, and we're talking about responses to different singularity forcing. So this is for the forcing function f being equal to these different inputs, or these different uh, uh, functions. So Dirac delta, all of these are uh, so-called uh, singularity inputs, right? We, we talked about in uh, lecture 1.1. So uh, in the following, I made a couple definitions here, but uh, I'll point those out when we get to them. So the columns are split up, so uh, damping of 0 to 1 is for these first three rows. So what is that called, that damping called? 
what kind of system do we have? Underdamp under system, right? Under. So underdamped, and uh, we have the three different singularity inputs, um, or singularity forcing functions, delta, unit step, and unit ramp going in. And then we have the characteristic response, which is the solution for y in this equation when f is equal to one of these singularity functions. So for the first row, we have the direct delta, or the impulse function, unit impulse function. And we get out a decaying exponential multiplying a sinusoid. OK, that makes sense. Under damped. Uh, when we did a step response or a free response, we had a similar thing happen, decaying exponential mul multiplying a sinusoid. Um, so the same thing happens for a direct delta. Essentially, uh, it has this decay that happens. You know, there's this spike, and then there's the decay. So that's our, that's our uh, direct delta uh, forcing. For the unit step, input. This is identical to uh, the expression that we, we uh, talked about last time when we talked in depth about the unit step response for an underdamped system. So we already saw that. It's just in the table. This is the one we already looked at, though. We didn't look at the, the characteristic response to a delta or for a unit ramp. So we're adding those in. So unit ramp, uh, it gets a little longer. But once again, um, we have a, uh, I'm a little concerned about, about this. I feel like there might need to be like a plus or something here. Um, so everybody do this and say, typo, question mark? <laughs> and then I will go back in and make sure there's not a typo there. I think there's a plus sign in there, but I want to make sure I give you the right steer. Um, so there's, this is a sinusoid though, and this is decaying exponential. Uh, this is a constant, so like it's kind of looking like the unit step response, except we also have this linear term here in time, right? So a, a ramp function looks, it's linear, and the response uh, when you have a ramp function also has a linear term in it too, because the output's going to also sort of linearly uh, move with the input with the forcing. And since it's under damped, we have this oscillation that's decaying, um, and then we have the, the ramp. There's no fish. So uh, I think, uh, so as, if there's a plus here, then the phase shift comes in if you combine the cosine and the sine together. Right. So you could write it with a phase shift, or you could write it with uh, cosine plus a sine. And apparently, when I wrote this, I decided to go with the cosine and the sine. I think that if you do combine them, this, the coefficient gets really nasty. So that's why I left it as cosine and sine. This one oscillates off to You're right. It does increase forever. So this looks something like, this looks something like that. Right? And yeah, as time goes to infinity, it goes to infinity. But the input's going to infinity. So if the input goes to infinity, probably the output's going to go to infinity. Um, but it does so linearly. So. And usually, we, we think of a ramp function as being something that we're going to have maybe applied for a, a short period of time. It's not really going to go on forever. But we want to have a sense of what it would react, how the system would react if we did put it, uh, a ramp input in for a while. Um, Cool. And then, uh, so that's the underdamped case. And then we've got the critically damped case. So different solutions emerge. Um, remember, there's a repeated root at this point. So you get that T factor in the solution. Um, so when you have critical damping and you have a delta input, you have this strange thing where you have a, a decaying exponential, no sinusoid and then a linear factor. So the linear factor is increasing, the exponential factor is decreasing. They're multiplying each other. Which one's going to win? Yeah. 
So, so you have you have this t that's which is just linearly increasing, and you have this exponential which is linearly or which is exponentially decreasing. Um, as time increases, which one's going to win? They're multiplied together. The exponential is going to win because this is going to be t is going to increase to say like at time equals 400, t will be 400, right? But it'll be e to the negative 400 times omega n, which is, is virtually zero. So 400 times zero is virtually zero. So this response looks something like, like this. Oh, it doesn't go back up. Okay. So it, it's, it's, there's a little spike that happens, and then it goes back down. And then uh, the unit step response is similar. Um, you still have this sort of t e to the minus omega n t term that happens, a decaying exponential, and then you also have this constant term. So in this case, it's going to increase exponentially. It might. Well, it, it, so it, it actually sort of like peaks out right just before it, o it overshoots and it flattens out. I'm having a hard time drawing that well. Something like that. Um, this is really nice for certain types of systems. For those of you who had me for instrumentation class, uh, measurement systems are nice to be around zeta equals 1 because um, we don't get this uh, overshoot and we also have a relatively quick response, sort of a nice trade-off. It doesn't have to be exactly one, but uh, one is, is a nice place to be for a measurement system. But for other types of systems, you need all kinds of other uh, behavior. So that's not, not to get fixated on zeta equal one. For every system, that's not the right place to design your system. Um, for some systems, as we'll see in the example, you want zeta to be very much not one. <laughs> so, uh, zeta greater than one. Oh, this this was critically damped, right? And then zeta is greater than one gives us overdance. And in this case, we we just have we have no we have no uh, possibility of oscillation happening. Um, we have no sinusoids in here. We're just going to have this exponential decay, um, but it's like sums of exponential decays, and then there's going to be, so for the delta, it's just going to be an exponential decay like this. For unit step, it's going to be an exponential decay like this. And then for unit ramp, it's going to be an exponential decay that goes to a a ramp, which is a little hard to see. Um, so I won't draw it because I'm going to probably give you the wrong impression. But this is, uh, these are exponentials, and this is uh, a constant term, and this is a, a ramp term. So um, you have this exponential thing that's happening, but it disappears after five, six of these tau one, tau two. We can call them time constants. Um, typically, we only refer to first order systems as having time constants. However, we can still discuss time constants and second order systems as being the rate of decay. So sort of like the real part of those exponentials. In this case, there are, there are two time constants. Um, so for a second order system, you're going to have two rates of decay. One of them being negative 1 over lambda 1. The other one being 1 over lambda 2. So where lambda 1 and lambda 2 are the roots of your characteristic equation that we talked about last time. Monday. OK? So um, this is our uh, uh, sort of table that we can go to that gives us these, these nice transient response uh, uh, solutions. And if you happen to have a unit step or a unit ramp function uh, as your input, you can just look up your solution, right? Or as your, as your forcing function, look up your solution. But 
the vast majority of the time, we won't be so lucky as to get a, a, a unit step input, say. I mean, that's, that's ideal. That's what we all want. But uh, in reality, our input is usually more complicated than, than that. So we have to use this uh, superposition and um, uh, differentiation rule sometimes. So that's what we'll do in the example here. So this is an example with superposition. The results of the above uh, are powerful, not so much in themselves, but when they are wielded with the principle of superposition, as the following example shows. So it's like now we've got a, a bucket. And these, these tables are like our bucket full of solutions. And we're going to use those. We're going to pull them out and combine them in certain ways to give us solutions to other things. Okay. So MRFM, so this example is MRFM cantilever beam with initial condition and forcing. Uh, if you were in my measurements class, we did an example with MRFM, but it was different. This is a different one. <laughs> uh, so in a magnetic resonance force micro, uh, uh, so in magnetic resonance force microscopy, MRFM, that's a technology that I do research on, which is why I'm using it as an example. So um, it's really cool. Uh, it's used, so I will describe what it's used for just very, very, very briefly. Um, it's, a, it's a highly sensitive, you can think of it as being a highly sensitive MRI machine. Um, that's scaled down to actually, instead of imaging entire bodies, uh, uh, it's trying to be sensitive enough to measure the three-dimensional position of a single nucleus. So the, uh, one of the fundamental properties, so fundamental properties of nature are like charge, right? Charge is a fundamental property of nature. Um, spin is another one. So. Uh, uh, Particles such as electrons and protons have uh, uh, this, this property of spin. And you can think of it as being a small magnetic moment. Okay? Um, so you can think of each proton, say, as ha of, be of being a little magnetic dipole that uh, if you were sensitive enough to measure the, the force of, um, you could possibly detect where it is in three-dimensional space. Fortunately, that force is super, super, super small. Uh, there have been experiments done on, that have measured a single electron uh, magnetic moments. So that is 600 times larger than the proton one. Proton one is the holy grail because a lot of times uh, electrons, most of the time, electrons come in, in pairs in atoms. So if you have uh, a pair, then the magnetic dipole is actually um, canceled out. So it doesn't have spin if you have paired electrons. So most substances don't have unpaired electrons. If it does, free radical, um, it's great. But that, a lot of biological stuff, which is what we want to image uh, down at that molecular level, does not have unpaired electrons. So anyways, measuring the three-dimensional structure of, of proteins, of biological proteins, is sort of like the holy grail of what that technology is all about. So anyways, I've been working on that for close to a decade now. So <laughs> I would love to just talk and talk about it, but I can't. So uh, that's the, the apparatus that we're, that we're going to look at um, a dynamic uh, model for. Okay. So a, a, a really specific aspect of it. So the primary detector, so in, a, in an MRI machine, the primary detector is a large coil. Uh, so you have a large coil that if the magnetic field in the coil changes, then the current going through the coil uh, is going to change, sort of like using um, an inductor backwards as a detector, right? Uh, so an inductive sensor is used in that. For MRFM, it turns out that uh, when you scale down the detector um, using a coil, the noise properties get worse and worse and worse. But if you use a mechanical oscillator instead, uh, uh, the electrical oscillator being like an inductor, a mechanical oscillator 
um, like a spring, the properties as you scale that down actually get better and better. So fewer and fewer impurities, uh, better and better noise properties. So if you use a single crystal cantilever beam, which is what we use, uh, the, the noise that you get inherent in uh, the detection is very low. So that's why we use it instead of a, an inductor, say a coil there. Um, so uh, we model this beam, um, this cantilever beam that's, that's uh, uh, the detector with a magnetic tip on the end of it. Uh, these cantilever beams, you can see the, the magnetic tips look like a piece of dust. Um, <laughs> you look at it and you're like, I think I can see that there's, but you have, so when we build this stuff, um, it's under a microscope itself. So it, we're building a microscope under a microscope. It's pretty fun. Also super frustrating. <laughs> Spent a few hours uh, in the lab swearing. So Okay. So uh, model the beam as a spring mass damper system with the mass being six picograms uh, where a picogram is 10 to the minus, uh, it's down here. Ah, it's like spread out over three pages. 10 to the minus 12 grams, or 10 to the minus 15 kilograms. So, super small mass. Um, spring constant, uh, K is 15 millinewtons per meter, which is very soft. Um, and damping coefficient, of a very small damping coefficient, B. Uh, magnetic input forces on the beam, U, are applied directly to the magnetic tip. That is, a Newtonian, a Newtonian force analysis yields the input-output ODE. So I'm going to write it like this. Oh, there's another typo. There should be only one dot on the second Y. <laughs> so y dot. So the, uh, we could do a simple force balance on this and find this equation. I didn't go through that derivation because I think we could all do that. F equals ma and we write everything in terms of the position y of the cantilever uh, where u is the input. So u is a force input so it is, uh, it doesn't come through any um, derivative terms or any scaling, but it could, okay? So that's something to keep in mind. Um, in this case, it's it doesn't. U is F in this case. The forcing function is the input in this case. It doesn't have to be, but it is. It just, we just lucked out, kind of. Okay, so uh, what is the natural frequency? Omega N is the first question we're gonna ask. What is the damping ratio? Second question we're gonna ask. Then we're going to find the free or find the free response for initial condition. Uh, uh, y zero is ten nanometers, and y dot is zero. And then, uh, so we're going to displace it by ten nanometers, and we're going to let it go and see what happens to it. And then we're going to find the impulse force response uh, for the input being three times Dirac delta. So then we're going to like hit it with a, ha a tiny, tiny little hammer. Okay. Uh, and then find the total response, the initial condition and forcing from above, uh, uh, they're both applied. So we want to find the case when their initial conditions and forcing are, are applied. So we're going to do all of that in 17 minutes, no problem, okay? So the first thing we do is we have to rearrange this equation because it is not in standard form, is it? Because y, y double dot here has a coefficient of m. So if we divide both sides of the equation by m, we will be then be in standard form, won't we? So if we did that, we would get y double dot plus b over m y dot plus k over m y equals 1 over m uh, u. Okay. So there is a scaling that comes in in standard form of u. 
Um, so when I said earlier that, that, that f is equal to u, I was wrong. F, is e e f of t is equal to 1 over m times u of t. So there is a scaling on the input. Um, there is no de derivative on it, however. So uh, we've got it in standard form. Standard form, we know, so we can actually, we don't have to go all the way back to the beginning. We can just go back to this table because it's got the standard form right here. Standard form, um, this coefficient here needs to be equal to our y dot coefficient. And this coefficient here needs to be equal to our y coefficient. So we have this little linear system of equations um, to solve. Actually, it's not linear. It's a little, little system of equations to solve for zeta and omega n for our system. So the easy one is that, so this has to be equal to omega n squared. And this has to be equal to 2 zeta omega n, right? So the first and easy situation is to solve for omega n, because we know that omega n squared has to equal k over m, right? Solving that, omega n, we, omega n is always positive, so it's just going to be the positive square root of k over m, which is a familiar expression for those of you who have taken vibrations. Um, okay, so that's the natural frequency. And now we can use the other expression that is, is uh, available to us, to this one here, to give us the damping ratio. So we have, this one's a little bit more work. We have two, I'll write it over here, two zeta omega n equals b over m. And if we solve that for zeta, we'll rearrange. So we've got b divided by 2m omega n. And we can plug in our omega n solution here. And we get b over 2. We have an m and then a square root of m. So I believe that becomes km. Square root of k we had. There was a square root of m in the denominator and an m in the numerator. Combine them, get that. So if that was confusing, I would encourage you to write out a couple more steps in that process, and I think it would become clear. I've just done this a few times, so I start to remember the steps. OK, so there's our zeta. So we've solved. So this was our answer to part A, right? A. This is our answer to part B. So we're already at C. Oh, there's a wrinkle on the screen. That sucks. OK. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I like our building better. <laughs> Way better. Only 100 years newer. Right, yeah. Although, I wonder if on a clear day you can see right here. That would be cool. Uh, no, no, I think we can see it that way. Maybe, I don't know. There's a tree in the wall, probably. There's some people who have offices on the fourth floor who can see Rainier, like, really well. And I sometimes think about trying to move my office up there, but then I remember that would really suck. <laughs> Especially because it gets so hot up there. Yeah. So, but having a view of Rainier is, like, my dream, so... Um, maybe I'll convince them to just like build Cibula way, way high. We are off track. Aaron is, does not like it. We need, we need to accommodate Aaron and we need to start to get back on track. Part yeah. three. 
Sorry. I, it might seem like I pick on Aaron, but he picks on me more. I think I've said that. Oh, question. Yeah. So you've got, uh, essentially you've got two equations and two unknowns. So you've got, um, well, I guess it's, you've got this equation here, which comes from equating omega n squared and k over m. And then you've got this equation here, which comes from 2 zeta omega n equals b over m. So this equation doesn't have zeta in it. So there's no way you can find zeta from it. You have to find zeta from this equation. So you have to know omega n. And we just so happen to know omega n because we have this other equation that gives us omega n directly. Right, sorry, sorry. The, the damping coefficient isn't the same thing as the damping ratio. They're not, you have to solve out for the yeah. damping ratio. And it's That's really a good hard. point. Zeta is not provided in most things. Gotcha. Yeah, so the damping coefficient is b. Damping ratio is zeta, so these are not the same. They're, they're related to each other. The greater b is, the greater zeta is, um, but zeta depends on more than just, so you can see the relationship here. So if b is bigger, zeta is bigger, uh, but if you increase k and you increase m, it decreases zeta. Okay, uh, great. So part C is uh, what we have. Oh, I guess it was part three. Yeah. Dang. Uh, I know <laughs> I gotta fix that. Uh, one and two. Not very well. Okay. That's a D and a B. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One and two. So let's do three. Oh. So three. Uh, we need to know what the free response is for this initial condition. So what we could do is solve the differential equation, right? But we're not going to because we have a bucket of solutions. So let's discover, first of all, um, we, we have zeta and we have omega n, but we didn't actually find them numerically. We need to compute what zeta is numerically to decide which case we have. It's definitely a second order system. Uh, and we got to figure out what zeta is to determine which case we, we are in. So can somebody do that calculation for us? It's definitely under damped. Yeah, it's definitely it's under damped. Definitely under damped. Uh, what was it? Yeah, it's for omega n. Oh, for omega n. That sounds ballpark correct. It's something like that. No, it's like 2.2 times 10 to the minus 6. That's the limit? I can't do much. Well, I, I feel like I'm going to say tiny. Yeah, it's 2 times 10 to the minus Because that's what we care about right now. Because numerically, it doesn't matter. As long as we know that it's between 0 and 1, we know what our solution is, right? And we can worry about the numbers later. As you know in my classes, the numbers are like the last thing we need to worry about. <laughs> so, yeah, question. How would you find out the number? Oh, I see. So we have the solution for zeta, right? It's, it's this. Uh, in the problem, I gave what b, k, and m were, right? So m is this, b is this, and uh, k is this. So you plug those into that equation, you get a very tiny number, 0. 0.0000 something. Yeah. The numbers are way easier. <laughs> I know. Well, it was something that it was on my mind when I wrote the problem. What can I say? So uh, this is tiny. So we have um, a situation that is, I'll write it over here, therefore underdamped.
Okay. So underdamp. So we're expecting oscillation to happen. Uh, it's also severely underdamp. So we're expecting a lot of oscillation to happen, and a slow, a slow decay. Okay. So uh, that is our situation. An underdamped system. So we're in this. So we've narrowed our focus down to just these situations here. Now, I asked for the, for the, uh, uh, the free response, right? Um, so actually, these are all forced responses. And there's really just, we have to go back to the free response section to find our solution, which is here. Um, for the underdamped case, so free response, underdamped, this is our lambda 1, our lambda 2, and we get this as our solution. So uh, let's write that. And we know what our y0 is. This was derived, remember, for y dot of 0 equals 0 and y dot, or, and y of 0 equal y naught. So this is 10 nanometers in our case. And then it's going to have this decay. We know all of these parameters, so we already have our free response given. But this is specifically, um, yeah, so this actually has the, the y naught for 10 nanometers. So we, we're, we have a complete solution sort of already at hand. So our free response, free response, uh, what was that equation number, for those of you who are still back here? 1.11, um, is y free of t equals y naught times e to the minus zeta omega n t divided by square root of 1 minus zeta squared times, was cosine? Yes. Cosine. And then we're using the damped natural frequency, omega d t minus psi, which psi is given. Um, so where um, psi is given in, what's the equation number for that? 1.12. 1.12. And uh, y naught equals 10 nanometers from the problem statement. Okay. So that was a lot easier than finding the homogeneous solution and the initial condition of flying and finding the coefficient. I mean, we could do it, but also it's easier not to. Four was to find the, uh, where was it? The impulse forced response uh, for input three delta, so scaled delta input. So what we need to do is we need to find the force response table, which is this one. Under damped, narrow it down to this, these rows. Find our delta characteristic response, which is the case when delta is our forcing function, which in this case it's our input, not our forcing function. So we've got to scale this, right? That's what superposition is going to tell us. So the characteristic response, let's write the characteristic response down first. Um, so the characteristic response is um, uh, it was e to the minus zeta omega n t divided by, was it omega n one, or square root of one minus zeta squared? And I think it was sine, sine omega, omega n t. Omega d. Oh, omega d t, that's right, omega d t. 
So that's the characteristic response. Um, but we need to scale. So superposition is helping us out here. Um, we need to scale this by 3. So our, um, well, we have to scale it by 3 to get to uh, the response of the system to 3 delta. But we then need to scale it by 1 over m before we find our total forced response, right? So we're going to have to hit it with superposition twice. So they're scaling it by 3 because the input is 3 delta. And we have to scale it by 1 over m because our forcing function is composed of not just u, which is 3 delta, but also 1 over m. So let's go by 3. Then I'll write because u of t equals 3 delta of t and by uh, 1 over m because um, f of t, our forcing function, is actually equal to 3, uh, or 1 over m <coughs> u of t. So our, our forced response then, our y forced of t is equal to, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give this a, 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 well, I'll just write it. I don't want to confuse people. Um, 3 over m, 3 over m times e to the minus zeta omega n t divided by omega n times 1 minus square root of 1 minus zeta squared. That wasn't very clear. Square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Um, all of that times sine omega dt. OK, there's our forced response. Now, step five. This is very similar to one of your homeworks, by the way. Uh, find the total response for the initial condition and forcing from above, uh, uh, or both applied. So, so for the situation where they're both applied. So we don't need to go back to the drawing board. We can just use superposition. Um, you have an initial condition is applied, uh, and a, a forcing function is applied, an input is applied. So superposition comes in again that y let's see would be equal to the free response so y sub fr plus y sub forced and we could write out what that is but it's kind of messy and we're out of time so I'm not going to but you just take the results from 4 and from 3, and you add them together. OK, I'll see you on Friday. Don't forget to do your homework.